Welcome back to the Canadian Liver Foundation's 2021 Live Right How Forum. Today, we are very excited to have a Nobel Prize winner to share his incredible journey with us. Dr. Michael Houghton is the director of the Lee Ka Sheng Applied Virology Institute. He was named the 2020 Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine, along with Dr. Harvey Alter and Dr. Charles Rice in recognition of the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. To learn about his journey from hepatitis C discovery to Nobel Prize, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Houghton. Hello, my name is Michael Houghton and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be speaking with uh, members of the Canadian Liver Foundation today. Um, I joined University of Alberta in 2010 and since then uh, I've uh, been working and uh, interacting with Karen Sito and Gary Fagan uh, and I really would like to thank them and their colleagues uh, Deborah Lee and Monica for all the great work you do furthering uh, research and development of liver disease in Canada. Really outstanding work that you do in the foundation and I really would like to thank you. And of course, all the patient and donor populations that are essential uh, for helping liver disease in Canada. Um, it's been a great pleasure to work with all of you. Um, well, a little bit about my history. I'm gonna describe briefly uh, the work that I've contributed to on hepatitis C. Um, I, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, originated from England. Um, and uh, I trained in molecular biology and worked on interferon genes, human interferon genes, which ironically were going to become very important for the treatment of hepatitis C in the uh, 80s and 90s. So uh, having trained as a molecular biologist, um, I, uh, together with my wife and our one-year-old son, we decided to leave England and go westward to California to join a startup biotech company formed by a couple of University of California professors, uh, Bill Rutter and Ed Penhout. And uh, the idea of the company was to use uh, people experienced in molecular biology um, to actually create medicines and diagnostics and vaccines. And uh, it worked very well. I joined the company in 1982. The company was called Chiron. And uh, it went on to our work where we discovered hepatitis C virus and developed blood tests. Um, but also it, the company resulted in making a hepatitis B vaccine made in yeast. Um, which is still used to this day. So um, it's a testament to how the private sector is so important to developing medicines. Uh, yes, we need academic centers to do basic research, uh, but we also need the private sector. So um, it was a pleasure for me to join Chiron in 1982. I was intending to continue my work on interferon genes. Um, they were becoming more and more important in human health and still are. Um, but I was introduced at Chiron to the problem of non-A, non-B hepatitis. And I thought that the molecular biological techniques that I had been using in England could possibly be applied to finding the cause of non-A, non-B hepatitis. It was known to be a huge problem in 1982. Um, it turns out that at that time in North America, USA and Canada, um, around 100 and maybe getting on for 200 people were being inf infected every day as a result of blood transfusion. And work that, um, my Nobel co-recipient Harvey Alter did in the 70s, he was based at the NIH, um, showed first of all, the extent of that blood contamination. Uh, secondly, 
he and colleagues showed that unfortunately in most cases, non enon B hepatitis persisted. Uh, it was one of those diseases that wasn't acute and then disappeared. Most patients um, had transaminitis, liver disease, and it will slowly progress over the years into serious chronic hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. Um, and so uh, we knew it was a huge problem. And uh, the methods that had been used before to discover hepatitis A and hepatitis B had been tried extensively for a long time um, without success. And so with the dawn of molecular biology, we thought that maybe uh, given some luck, we could identify hepatitis C. So um, I had my own lab at Chiron and uh, I decided that I would uh, dedicate my lab to try to find the cause of non enon B hepatitis. What was it? It was likely caused by a virus. Wasn't certain. <laughs> there was some theories that it might be caused by a prion. Um, but uh, for the next seven years, I dedicated my lab uh, with collaborators um, to try to find really what was the cause. And once you know what it is and you can isolate it, you can do something about it. So I'm just switching to some slides. Um, just allow me to get these up, please. Um, let's see, I've got to share the screen. And hopefully this is working. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to talk to you, um, but I just wanted to state that um, when I started in 1982 at Chiron in California, it was in the Bay Area. Um, really what we had available to us was we had clinical and animal samples. The chimpanzee had been shown by many groups to be a good model for non enon B hepatitis. And so we had, we had blood, we had liver biopsies from humans and chimps um, as a source of material. But um, believe it or not, uh, for those scientists amongst you, uh, PCR had not yet been discovered. And it wasn't until the late 80s after we discovered the virus that it was really uh, used routinely in laboratory science. Unlike Hep B, there was no antigen or antibody associated with non anon B hepatitis. There was no cell culture system. Um, as was developed uh, for hepatitis A. Uh, and technology was really quite crude then. A lot more advanced than when I started science in 1972, <laughs> but it was still, still pretty basic. S to sequence uh, a small amount of DNA would take months. So we didn't have a molecular handle. Um, and so over the ensuing seven years, we tried lots of different methods that I won't bore you with, but um, kind of in layman's terms, I would say, you know, we tried, you know, really anything that we thought stood a chance. Um, and I would say the number of approaches we used probably was at least 30 different approaches to try to identify this elusive virus. Um, so non enon B was shown to be a, a, a quantity and to, to exist in 1974, 1975 by um, Harvey, Alter, as well as Fred Prince and other colleagues. But it wasn't until we published our papers in 1989, 15 years later, that we were able to identify and show that we had um, cloned the virus. And uh, that's an indication of how difficult it was at that time. We tried many different approaches without success, uh, but eventually uh, we found one experiment that worked in seven years. Um, let me just try to quickly explain it. So we took chimpanzee plasma that we knew was infectious. We ultra centrifuged it, put it under high G-force so that the smallest virus known to man would pellet at the bottom of the tube here. We didn't know what kind of virus it was. Was it DNA? Was it RNA? So we extracted both and converted that nucleic acid into bacterial clones. 
each clone, each colony, if you like, on a agar plate contained one nucleic acid from that pellet. Essentially, what we were doing was a really uh, early stage proteomics experiment before the word proteomics became um, in, in, in contemporary use. Um, you end up with millions of clones, each with one piece of nucleic acid from the pellet. You can induce those clones to make protein from the clone nucleic acid, and that's why it's a proteomics type of approach. Even though antibodies had not been identified in non A, non B hepatitis patients, it was a very persistent virus, as I mentioned. So I was very concerned that maybe there was a very poor immune response to this virus and, and uh, it may not be highly potent antibodies. But we took a gamble that there were antibodies. So we took non A, non B diagnosed patients incubated with our proteomics libraries. And uh, after mm, two years of working on this approach, we had a lot of failures. Uh, we came up with clone 511. It was a little tiny clone. It was only 100 base pairs. Uh, it had some cloning artifacts in it as well. So, but fortunately, we were able to show it was derived from the virus of hepatitis C that was the cause of blood-borne non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, we showed that because we could show the clone was not derived from the human genome or the chimpanzee. It was derived from a large RNA molecule, typically seen with RNA viruses, 10,000 nucleotides. Um, and moreover, we showed that the protein that 511 encoded um, could actually bind to antibodies only found in non-A, non-B patients, not in Hep A or Hep B infected patients. And then as we sequenced more of the genome, we started to see sequence homologies, sequence identities, very faint, but nonetheless significant ones with the Flavy viruses. And that's when we knew we had it. Um, so this was around the end of 1987. And then it took us a long time to get the whole sequence. And um, eventually we published our work in Science, um, one of the leading journals at the time in 1989. So um, this was a team effort. I was the uh, project leader, the manager, if you wish, of the program at Chiron. Uh, Kui Lim Chu uh, did a fantastic job screening all of these libraries and analyzing the clones. Uh, he was one of the most careful experimental uh, scientists I've ever worked with. Um, George Kuo was in the next door lab to mine at Chiron. He wasn't working on hep C at the time, uh, but he was a very bright guy and he gave me some ideas and, and urged me to try the proteomics approach, which I was a bit reluctant to try for a couple of years because of the risk involved. And, I was concerned about antibodies being limited, but um, George um, helped to persuade me to try it. Uh, and then George made big contributions after we had identified the virus. He developed the first immunoassay and uh, helped us with a lot of the work. And then Dan Bradley was at the CDC. He was one of the exponents of the chimpanzee model. And Dan gave us a continuous supply of chimpanzee materials from 1982 all the way through for the next 10 years. And uh, Dan also was a, a stimulus for our work, very much so. So this was a team effort um, of mainly these four people, but other people like Dr. Amy Weiner, who went to work at the Gates Foundation, and Lacey Overby. Um, he set up the Abbott diagnostic programs in the 70s for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. He was a great mentor, a great stimulus also, and a great man. Um, so um, once you have a virus cloned in bacteria, essentially you, you can come to grips with it. You now have vast amounts of the DNA, you can make vast amounts of the proteins. And then with the proteins, once you purified them, you can set up diagnostic assays. So, um, 
this is just a cartoon showing uh, that the 10,000 nucleotide long RNA genome um, encoded a large polyprotein that was cleaved into a variety of different viral proteins. I won't bore you with all the details, but 511 clone came from what we call non-structural protein 4B. It had a highly immunodominant B cell epitope um, to which antibodies bound with high affinity. With all the information on the genome uh, that we had, we were able to add other antibody binding epitopes elsewhere and developed a series of blood diagnostics detecting antibody. And uh, this is a slide I got from the CDC. It's a very old slide, but it's looking at the incidence of acute hep C. Um, in the USA. And you can see when we introduced our first test, uh, there was a big drop in incidence of uh, acute hep C. When we introduced our second test, it went down even further. We actually developed with our partners, um, uh, orthodiagnostics, Abbott, Sanofi Pasteur and others, we developed a total of five tests. Uh, and that included nucleic acid tests. and once those tests were rolled out over the next few years, um, we completely eliminated um, post-transfusion hepatitis C. We could not, to my knowledge, um, a case of transfusion associated hepatitis C has never been seen since the rollout of these tests. So we were very pleased with um, being able to do this um, and it was a, a great reward for our hard work. Um, so, um, the cloning also ushered in the era of uh, developing specific antivirals to hep C. We had interferon, as I mentioned, which was a mainstay of therapy in the 90s and uh, early 2000s. Um, interferon with a guanosine analog called ribavirin um, could cure around a half of the patients diagnosed with non enon B. But the therapy was long, it was quite toxic, it was quite uh, hard to bear. People had influenza symptoms, uh, some people became suicidal as a result of the therapy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the, the big rush was on after we cloned the virus to identify specific antivirals. And uh, it took a surprisingly long time. I mean, we discovered the virus in 89 and published on it. It wasn't until 2015, so what, 26 years later, that we had finally really good antivirals. And the antivirals uh, were developed by targeting the polymerase encoded by hep C, uh, which is in non-structural protein 5B, and also uh, antivirals targeting non-structural protein 5A, um, 5A is an unusual protein. It's not a classic enzyme, but it's essential for virus replication and, and sequestration. And uh, Bristol Myers Squibb scientists developed um, the Cladosphere, which was the pioneering drug of that class targeting NS5A. It's an incredibly potent antiviral. And then uh, other groups uh, developed uh, protease inhibitors targeting the NS3 protein, which is a serine protease. So um, this was work published by Jordan Feld in Toronto and Graham Foster and their colleagues, um, New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. This was fantastic news because it's showing the Gilead cocktail, Sovospuvir and Velpatosphere, given for 12 weeks to patients with the six different genotypes of HCV, genotypes one through six, and it's showing the cure rate, the sustained viral response after just three months of therapy. And you can see that irrespective of genotype, nearly all patients were cured. And uh, it was fantastic work done by uh, the clinical investigators, but also Gilead and the uh, Buvir involved a lot of scientists at Pharmacet and then um, Gilead and Velpatosphere involved Gilead scientists working 
on the discovery by Bristol Myers Squibb scientists uh, who developed the cladosphere, the original drug. So this was wonderful. So we now had um, uh, direct acting antivirals. And I think uh, it's wonderful that we can now cure hep C patients. What we need to end this pandemic, hepatitis C is a pandemic like COVID. It's still killing around 400,000 people a year all around the world. We've got to stop it with a vaccine. With the availability of the genome that we cloned into bacteria, we were able to develop a vaccine which can protect chimpanzees. It's the only one that I'm aware of that can protect in any animal model. We've shown that we can do that with the two envelope glycoproteins, E1 and E2. We can express both of those in um, transfected mammalian cells. We can purify them. When we immunize chimps with them, we were able to show that we can protect them against persistent hep C infection uh, following a experimental challenge. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll dispense with that. But um, at the University of Alberta, um, a senior research uh, associate in my lab, John Law, showed that in a clinical trial that I ran while I was still in the States in around 2010, uh, John could detect uh, antibodies in the human recipients of our E1, E2 vaccine that can neutralize the infectivity of all the different strains seen around the world. So these different colors represent different strains and the um, height of the bars indicates the extent of neutralizing the infect infectivity in cell culture. What it means is even though this vaccine was derived from a single strain, it has broadly cross neutralizing antibodies. So that's a very, uh, very important finding. And uh, we've used that to go on and develop what we think is a very promising vaccine using E1, E2, uh, as well as some other components. And uh, COVID has interrupted our manufacturing uh, of our vaccine, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, we are manufacturing our vaccine under GMP, good manufacturing process, which you need before you go into clinical trials. We're doing that at the University of Alberta, and we've got clinical partners waiting to test our vaccine around the world. Uh, we were planning to start the clinical trials this year. Probably now it's put back to the early part of next year, but um, we're hoping very much that this vaccine will work and uh, will finally get rid of the pandemic that is hep C. Um, well, I just want to turn to some questions and, and my answers. Um, so Monica and Karen forwarded these questions from uh, some of the audience today. Um, so why and how do you find your path to discover hep C? Why hep C, not hep B? Well, I described uh, briefly how we discovered hep C. Um, when we started the work in 1982, hepatitis B was already discovered by Baruch Blomberg. That actually happened in the 60s, um, 1960s. And so there was a lot of papers published in the 80s. Uh, and it was very confusing, I must say, because uh, different people were saying different things about what hep C really was. Some people were saying it was a hep B relative. It turned out not to be. but um, Basically, Hep B was already on the road to uh, prevention. Um, diagnostics were available in the 70s, and a vaccine was developed in the late 70s. So, Hep C was really the outstanding challenge um, in the 80s. Uh, what are some of the challenges throughout this journey? Uh, how did you and your team tackle these challenges? Well, yeah, we had a lot of failure. Um, and it wasn't easy failing in a biotech company where you have investors giving you money expecting returns. So uh, that was a big challenge, but um, on the other hand, you just have to uh, feel that it's important work and you just have to uh, persist if you think the work's important enough, which is what uh, we did, we persisted. And 
we tackled the failure by keep on trying lots of different approaches, anything we could think of. I didn't have time to tell you what they were, but basically there were a lot of options. Um, groping around in the dark, but there's different ways to grope <laughs> in the dark, uh, on your belly, walking, running, touching. Anyway, we tried lots of different approaches and eventually came up with one that worked. What's it like to be a Nobel Prize winner? Well, I would say, um, obviously, uh, it's very nice to be awarded the ultimate prize in science. Um, uh, it's also exhausting because you become a celebrity overnight and everybody wants to talk to you, which is also nice, but it also can get a bit tiring and a bit fatiguing. Um, but I'm not complaining. Uh, what's the ceremony like? Well, we, we didn't go to Stockholm because of COVID. Um, we've been invited to go to this year's um, ceremony, but we'll have to see what COVID's doing in uh, Stockholm in December. Um, but um, it's okay. I mean, the ceremony is not that important to me. Um, winning the Nobel is, is obviously a huge honor. Uh, what's your next big project? Well, we have a lot at the University of Alberta. Um, I, part of the reason I went to U of A was to work with Lorne Tyrell, who did fantastic work on developing lamivudine drug treatment for hepatitis B patients. And uh, he was someone that I always liked and admired his work. So I've been closely working with Lorne. We set up the Lika Shing Applied Virology Institute. We have a lot of projects going on where we're trying to develop uh, vaccines, therapeutics to different diseases. And they're not just viruses, um, but we are working on the hep C vaccine, as I mentioned. We're working on a vaccine against group A streptococcus with a, a leader in the field uh, who's an adjunct professor at the U of A. Um, we have a great uh, group of chemists working on new antivirals, the cytomegalovirus, which is a big problem in transplant patients. We're working with an outstanding neurologist at the U of A on a novel approach to Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a huge problem, as you all know. The industry, the pharmaceutical industry and academia has spent billions of dollars trying to solve it. It still hasn't been solved. So a little bit like hep C, um, you have to keep trying new things. And um, uh, our neurologist colleague has tried a different approach and we're working with him to try to develop um, more molecule drugs against um, Alzheimer's. And then the other outstanding liver disease that's left is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, which is not just due to overeating and obesity. Uh, thin people can get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and it's a serious disease and uh, we're working uh, hard on that as well. So uh, thank you very much. I think I've talked over time, but um, it has been a pleasure to do this for the Canadian Liver Foundation. And uh, I've been really so impressed with the wonderful people um, that head this organization and the wonderful support they get from their colleagues and as well as the patient groups and the support groups. So uh, congratulations and my admiration to you. Uh, I deal with test tubes, you deal with patients and trying to make life better for them. Um, in different ways. Uh, so we all work together and uh, it's been a pleasure to know you all and uh, take care and uh, see you soon, I'm sure, at a meeting in Canada. Bye-bye.